So good morning to some, good evening to others. Uh, from what I can see, we have about the same number of uh, Asia-based, Australia-based guests and uh, Europe-based guests. And welcome to you to this 11th public seminar in the Brokic series. My name is Heidi Ostbehaugen. I do research on contemporary China at the University of Oslo. And I'm the principal investigator of the project Brokering China's Extroversion, which hosts these seminars. Uh, the discussion, as you've seen, will be recorded. So we'll make the uh, recording available after the seminar. And uh, Christian will post a link to the previous seminars in the discussion field in case you're interested in checking some of those out. Today, we'll talk about gender, identities, and aspirations in China. And we have with us Fran Martin and Feiling Xie to speak to these topics uh, based on their recent books. And uh, the discussion will be moderated by Mimi Lau, who's a journalist at South China Morning Post, and she will also introduce the speakers. So over to you, Mimi. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the seminar, um, China's Restless Young Women Negotiating Gender, Class, and national identities. Uh, my name is Mimi Lau. I'm a journalist with the South China Morning Post. I will be facilitating the seminar today. Um, here is a bit of background about myself. I was born in mainland China and migrated to Hong Kong as an infant following my parents' footsteps. I grew up and studied in Hong Kong and received my journalism degree in Sydney, Australia. I have been a journalist for 16 years and half of my career was spent in covering the greater Southern China region as a correspondent. Um, five years ago, I was transferred back to Hong Kong. Currently, I'm covering contentious Chinese politics with a focus in human rights, religious and ethnic affairs, as well as um, civil society in China. I also host the Inside China podcast produced by the South China Morning Post. Um, so many of you might wonder how important is gender for young people in modern China, what challenges and aspirations are central to young Chinese women. In this seminar will focus on how young Chinese women from China negotiate different expectations and identities, both inside and outside their motherland. Um, today, we are very excited to have two excellent scholars who have poured in their time and energy investigating the lives of young Chinese women and their intimate portrayals alongside with insightful scholarly analysis has provided us encounters to these women's individual struggles under a powerful regime and biases of international politics. So um, documenting their real life experiences and perspectives um, of these privileged daughters of China have allowed us to journey alongside with them as they seek out independence, individuality, and attempts to resolve conflicts imposed on their bodies, minds, and spirits. Um, in a China where challenging, uh, where, where rapidly changing uh, birth control policy places heavier than ever family obligations over them. Um, I will start um, today's event by introducing our speakers. The first speaker is Fran Martin. She is an associate professor and reader in cultural studies at the University of Melbourne. She researches gender and sexuality, globalization, contemporary Chinese and Taiwanese fiction, film, and popular cultures, transnational culture flows in Asia, popular television in Asia, and transnational student experience. She recently published the book, The Dream of Flight, The Lives of Chinese Women Students in the West, which came out two months ago. It's a labor of a five-year ARC Future Fellowship project that uses lengthy, lengthy scientific description to research the social and subjective experiences of young Chinese women studying and living in Australia. Frank is also fluent in Mandarin and has previously studied in Beijing, Shanghai, and Taiwan before returning to Australia to commence her academic career. Our second speaker is Kailin Xie, who is a lecturer in international development at University of Birmingham. And previously, she was a teaching fellow in gender and international development 
at the Department of Politics and International Development at University of Warwick after completing a PhD in women's studies. Kailin researches the underlying social, cultural, and political tensions underpinning China's economic success from a gendered perspective. Her recent book, Embodying Middle-Class Gender Aspirations, Perspectives from China's Privileged Young Women, which was published last year, illustrates the centrality of heterosexual marriage as a primary institution in the organization and reproduction of labor for the market economy imbued with gendered inequality. Our speakers today will introduce their latest books and will be able to take questions after their presentations. Our audience are welcome to send in written questions as direct messages to me in Zoom chat. You're free to choose to remain anonymous while asking the questions. I will now give the space to Dr. Fran Martin. Thank you, Mimi, for the kind introduction. Um, and thanks too to Siv and Heidi and the Brokex project um, for the opportunity to present today. It's a real pleasure to be here to share my work with you. Um, or rather to be here while you're there. I wish I could be there in person, um, but this is, this is good enough for me right now. I'm also very excited to share the panel with uh, Kailin because I'm a big fan of her book, um, which came out last year. And it's also a real pleasure to meet Mimi Lau in the forum. So what I wanna do now is to share with you a PowerPoint presentation um, where I will just kind of lead you through some, um, some, some background and some discussion of the project that underlies this book. So I guess you can see from the table of contents here, um, it gives you, I, I was hoping, like a brief summary overview of the book and how the chapters proceed. So the book really has two parallel foci and maybe you can see some of that from the table of contents. First, it presents um, an ethnographically based investigation of the subjective, experiential and affective dimensions of everyday life for Chinese student trans migrants living mobile lives between and across China and Australia. And I mean, you can really see that in the topics of the chapters there. So that's, it. Be, as an ethnographic project, it has almost a, a quasi sort of phenomenological focus on embodied affective experience in a range of realms, both um, external in the world and internal and subjective. The second theme of the book though, and the focus of the book is the one I'm really focusing on today more than that one. This is the question of education mobility's complex interrelationship with women students gendered experience specifically, and their identification and subjectivity in a gendered register. Um, I wanna now, pull the focus back uh, from the book, which is really the product of a, of a long research project, to consider the genesis of that project from which the book arises um, and its animating themes and questions, that is, of the project itself. So um, the book arises from a, a wonderful, generous tranche of funding that I was privileged enough to receive from the Australian Research Council, which essentially allowed me to focus for five years of my life and my participants' lives full-time on doing just this research project. So I've put the methods up on the screen here. Um, it was an extremely resource intensive project. A, a rare degree of um, focus was, was enabled by the time and, and the funding that I, that I was um, given. So I was able to follow 50, I'll say 50 plus, there were kind of 50 women in the core group 56 in a slightly larger group with six other women also participated. I followed them really from their pre-departure thoughts and feelings. I interviewed 30 women before they left China, pre-departure, through several years of their lives and studies in Melbourne. And then many of them who had graduated by the end of the project, I also spoke to them, you know, after their graduation in their graduate destinations. I recorded interviews. I had many hundreds of hours of informal conversations. Um, there were group in one-on-one -on -one activities organized by me and by them to enable participant observation. I engaged in digital ethnography through social media, particularly WeChat, but also um, other, other platforms. 
Um, I solicited participants' cultural production, their photographs, their map making. I should say that the photograph on the cover of the book is from one of my participants, a beautiful image that I really like. Um, and I, it, this is um, preceded by a pilot study um, with 15 participants. That was a simpler method of simply interviewing them um, beforehand. Um, so really over the years of this study, I feel like these young women became part of my life and my family's life in quite an intense everyday way. And I became part of their lives. So I feel it was successful in, in that regard. Now, why did I want to do the study? Um, I guess the motivating questions really were to do with gender. If we, if we look at um, the available statistics for students departing China for study abroad, 60% of them, according to the Chinese Department of Education in 2016, were women. Um, if we take into account the skewed um, gender ratio at birth, uh, where there are more male than female babies born, we see that women are about 30% more likely to study abroad than men. So we might wonder, why is that? Um, and when we've considered why is that, I was also interested in how would gender make a difference in these young women's um, experiences of educational mobility and in what forms of subjectivity would be produced through these kinds of education mobility projects in relation to gender identification, in relation to life plans, gendered and otherwise, and in relation to perceptions of value and meaning, really the meaning of life or, or, or one's plan for having a significant life, how would this be affected? So um, one of my central claims in the book and in the study as a whole is that the subjectivity, the subjectivity of China's post-90 generation of middle-class women is conditioned by multiple historically specific competing and sometimes contradictory, often contradictory understandings of what a woman is, what being a woman means, and how one should practice this form of gendered identity. And of course, this is very central to Kailin's work as well, which is why I'm so excited to read her book summarizing some of this. Now, this contradictory situation is the case even before the women leave China, right? And, and, and potentially have their outlook even more complicated by experiences abroad. So the two, to simplify, the two key kind of frameworks which I identify are first of all, this one, um, we might call it enterprising selfhood. This is often understood as a neoliberal style discourse of enterprising selfhood and competitive self-advancement, which has arisen alongside economic liberalization in China. Multiple studies of state and commercial media, advertising work practices and ordinary people's reflections on their situation point to the pervasiveness of a structure of feeling that posits the self-governing, rational choice-making, independent and individualized subject as author of his or her own fate in the market society. So this privatized self-governing subject, we should also note, is really well suited to a time when the state is withdrawing from many aspects of welfare provision, kind of leaving individuals um, more untethered than before to make their way. Um, in the market society. However, and I'm, I also underline that this discourse is, is attractive to well-resourced daughters of the urban middle classes, and they're encouraged to identify with this kind of self-making self who is self-reliant, not reliant on the state, you know, decreasingly reliant on the family. Their parents will encourage them to think this way in the time when they are undergoing education and training. Um, so they come to think, they come to identify often with this very pervasive discourse. Um, and there's a quote from um, Yin Xiang Yan to this, to this degree. I'm sure many of you are familiar with his work in sociology. Alongside this discourse and also influential is a counter discourse though, which is based on neo-traditionalist understandings of women's naturally marriage and family oriented disposition. So this is really um, a re-emergent structure of feeling. Um, participants would often want to tell me, oh, it's Chinese tradition to think this way. And I, I take their point. It is, of course, influenced by hundreds or thousands of years of tradition, but it is very much remade in the post-Mao in the era, in, in, the, in the late reforms era with the um, aid of the state. This discourse operates through public representations, including government campaigns and popular media, as well as intimately through family and peer pressure. Um, and it essentially produces a, a vision that a proper woman um, should have an identity based on an, an essentialist understanding of her gentle 
nurturing and family-centered nature. Um, so it's a real turnaround from um, the kind of Maoist state feminism of, of, of the high socialist um, years. Um, so there's much more that we could say about that. I, I'll, I'll cut myself off a bit in the interest of time, but we should observe that the rise to prominence of this re-traditionalized gender discourse is linked as is the first discourse on this slide with a number of significant structural shifts that either directly were led by or were enabled by the state, um, especially the encouragement of women back to the family in times of rising urban unemployment um, and uh, the toleration of, an incre of increasingly open gender discrimination in labor markets, a widening gender wage gap, um, and the concentration of capital increasingly in the hands of husbands at the expense of wives, as Lita Hong Finch's work on the so-called leftover women phenomenon has taught us. So I argue really that the coexistence of these two discourses produce unavoidable um, contradictions for middle-class urban women in the post-90s era as they navigate their 20s. Um, because of the timeline on so-called timely marriage and children, their 20s are very pressurized and I wondered how does study abroad then impact on how they will um, negotiate such contradictions. So let's continue. The key findings and claims are just in a nutshell, <laughs> much quicker than reading the book. Um, I found that overseas study essentially strengthens women's identification with the, with the first of those discourses, with globally extensive neoliberal style ideals of the mobile enterprising individual while correspondingly weakening their attachment to that neo-traditionalist model of femininity that's promoted in China's post-socialist public culture. That is to say, women's transnational education experience advances their disembedding from national systems of gender ideology to an extent, none of this is black and white, of course, but it also advances their re-embedding into a more transnational systems of neoliberal style ideology, which are also of course present at the national level um, as I have discussed. So I wanna now just kind of move through a few participant quotes to, to give you like a sense of the richness of the data. And this is from recorded interviews. Um, these are just selected quotations that I think kind of um, highlight particularly clearly some of the themes I wanna draw out. So this one is from Fang, who was 32 and from Yunnan, but was working in Shanghai when I interviewed her, obviously after her graduation when she was working. She wasn't one of the core participants, um, but she spoke very clearly and lucidly about the, the, influence, the influence that she felt her Australian education had had on the way she was viewing her gendered self and her life projects. And I've highlighted here in yellow the key the key parts. It's to do with a deinstitutionalization of the life course in her mind. I feel that what you do, she said, shouldn't be connected with your age. You shouldn't think about what you're supposed to do at what age. There's nothing you should or shouldn't do, only things you want to do or don't want to do. I think my life is my own and I should be the one to decide how I live it. It's not about how you, that is the elders generally, she meant, I think, uh, wish me to live. Um, there's a pretty big difference then she observed between herself and her peers. Um, another example here, I apologize, it's so long that I'm just gonna leave the Chinese version there for a minute. I quite like this one. This is from a core participant who I'm calling Chin, who was 26 at the time of this interview um, after her study in Australia. And she was a little bit self-mocking here, but I think she's also, being rather to the point. She says, you know, I want my own life plan, which is a bit different from, different from others who, who tend to perhaps uh, take more heed of what their parents want. So what's your life plan? I said, well, I want to, before I'm 30, achieve bag buying freedom, okay? <laughs> my balzio, which is a, a way of thinking and speaking, which comes from a 2017 internet meme. Whoops, um, we seem to have gone the wrong way. Um, how do I get back when I'm sharing my screen? Oh, uh, let's see if I can figure it out. Uh, yeah, sorry about this slight tech glitch. Believe it or not, in all these two years of lecturing online, I've never had to go back in the slide while screen sharing. Um, so she goes on to say, she told her parents, you know, until she can 
sort of achieve this certain level of income and consumption power, um, she won't consider marriage. And then she goes even further and says, I've deleted get married and have a baby from my to-do list. And I don't have the feeling of being a leftover woman. I feel I'm constantly living under my own self-enrichment. So I'm always young. I don't feel as if I'll be eliminated in the social struggle or whatever. I don't. I don't have any sense of crisis. She's perfectly happy with this kind of post-traditional gender identity that she had elaborated. So just to summarise the type of subjectivity which comes out of um, these you know, discussions, but also the many others that I, that I gathered during um, the years of the project, I kind of crystallised them in the book down to a particular type of post-overseas study subjectivity based on a number of points. Number one, a mobile imaginary, the idea that one could move around, whether it's within China, between places, or whether it's internationally, that, that moving is something you would do and you can do and you, you will do if you have the opportunity. So I call that a mobile imaginary. Definitely a strong finding of ideological individualization. And I've got here a number of phrases that different participants used in casual conversation to indicate this. So living life in your own way, living out my own self, living for yourself, living more self-centeredly, living to become yourself, not deferring to others, as we saw in one of the previous quotes. Ambition, this kind of centering of ambitious, ambitiousness, self-confidence in the pursuit of goals, grasping every opportunity to, to get ahead. Reflexivity too, in a cultural sense, the, the sense that one is looking out onto widened horizons. One has a heightened, a lot of participants spoke about heightened tolerance or baron for difference and feeling that their old, their, their old classmates back in China had become or now seem to them rather parochial and as if their, their worldview was rather narrow. Consumerism, I mean, we saw the thing about the bag buying freedom um, as, a, as an indicator of income, the idea that one could spend on oneself for pleasure, indulge in luxury consumption when you can afford it, and that this is not immoral or unethical, um, that, thrift, that, that sort of some students' previous valuing of thrift from their family habitus had been kind of changed by studying with, with perhaps wealthier students um, in Australia together with them. A professional orientation to career development over marriage or family plans. Um, interestingly, I don't have time to talk about this one really, but employer identification I found in their experiences of work, sympathy for employers positioned even when they were being exploited based on gender and age bias in Chinese labour markets and race and visa status, status bias in Australia. And I think that employer identification speaks to their habitus as part of the middle class and often as coming from families who are who own their own business and are, and are entrepreneurs. So they've got that sort of slight blindness to one's own oppression, I guess, in certain situations. And certainly gender detraditionalization, this critique of the normative gendered life course that we've seen in the examples, uh, resistance toward reorientation towards marriage and family in one's late um, 20s. And just to finish, because I know I'm, I may be going over time here, I suspect. Um, just some, some broader points that came out of the study, like where I feel it, it, it leaves me, and this is where the book ends up. I mean, really to step back, it's a project thinking about how gender shapes mobility. So being a woman makes one move differently, but on both macro and meso and, and, and micro scales, or all three, but also mobility shapes one's sense of what one's gender is or, or can be. Uh, also, a rather perverse relation, we might say, between neoliberal subjectivation and gendered experience, in so far as for my participants, their increased identification with what we might critique as a neoliberal ethos from a kind of, you know, leftist intellectual position may in fact have progressive gendered effects vis-a-vis -vis these middle class women's position in the patriarchal family. So that's saying that you're going to rely on yourself, that you're going to make it out there, that you're going to be competitive in the marketplace. All of this is, you know, in support, obviously, of, of, of the ethics of global capitalism, but it does have progressive gender effects in the, in the realm of the family. So, I mean, that's kind of interesting food for thought in a way. Uh, another key point is that throughout the book, uh, the high emotional toll of constantly navigating between contradictory value systems. This is both at home and abroad, even when abroad, you know, home is never more far away than your phone. 
So one is never completely in one place or the other, but as I've called them, trans migrants, they're living between places and therefore navigating between contradictory value systems, which is often extremely painful and difficult for them. So we mustn't, while kind of finding all of this very interesting, we mustn't lose sight of the personal costs, the human costs of being that pivot point between systems is difficult to do. Um, and, and finally, I, I feel that the work as a whole, the book as a whole, brought out for me as a, as a writer and a researcher, an unresolvable tension between macro sociological abstraction, which is mostly what I've been doing tonight um, with your, in my night time today with you here, uh, thinking about, you know, broad trends and big, big sociological terms like gendered individualization and neoliberalism and whatever else. On the one hand, and on the other hand, the phenomenological singularity of people's affective and embodied and subjective experience as revealed through ethnography. And that's the case, you know, both in my observation of participants and in my relationship with them and my own experience of the research. I just kind of feel uh, not stuck, but I just feel that tension can't be resolved, um, which is interesting in itself. So thank you for listening and I, I had best stop there. Thank you, Frank, uh, for your presentation. Um, I would like to invite our second speaker, Dr. Kailin Xie, to talk about her latest research. Kailin, please. Well, first of all, I just want to thank you, uh, the University of Oslo Department of Cultural Study and Oriental uh, Language for today's uh, opportunity to share my work. And thank you for uh, Heidi and um, Mimi, and as well as other organi uh, organizers for this panel, because I really, really admire Professor Martin's work. As I was reading this book uh, this week, I got really excited and I thought, well, I wish this book came out when I was writing my book. And I think we could create some really interesting dialogue and especially I love the rich uh, ethnographic, uh, ethnographic details you include in your book, even though you mentioned the tension, but I think that's the be beauty of it. So you, on one hand, you offer us this um, rich ethnographic detail, but at the other side, you give us this very sophisticated uh, theorization, which I thoroughly enjoyed. And I think our research really speak to each other because we're almost like looking at very similar issues um, from both sides of the coin. You were looking at the international migration, uh, mig um, international student who migrate outside of China and looking at their life in this kind of uh, in between places. And my work is looking at these kind of high, uh, privileged young women, um, maybe one generation before your participants, which uh, most of them were born in the 1980s, the first generation of the only child, and um, looking at their adult life um, living within China and how they navigate uh, with all these tensions you just mentioned wonderfully with this kind of neoliberal so, sort of self-fashioning become self-investment and then how to become this kind of entrepreneuring self and on the other hand, and deal with this kind of neo-traditionalist uh, familialism that is rising um, in China as well. So, um, okay, so my book, Embodying Middle Class Gender Aspiration Perspective from China's Privileged Young Women. Before I start to uh, share with you the content of the book, I just want to share a little bit background and uh, what drove me to start this project. Back in 2013, I don't know how many of you might have come across this news article, which was published by BBC uh, in 2013. Um, as you can see the title, China's Leftover Women Unmarried at 27, I think, uh, Frank also mentioned this in uh, the, the term leftover women, which was like very trendy for a long time. A lot of people have wrote a book about this as well. So my, what, a friend of mine saw this news and he came to me and said, hey, Kaylin, check this out. And you're running out of, uh, your, well, you're running out of time. You really need to catch up. And then we both laughed, obviously he was teasing me, but also we uh, kind of like feel outraged by the term of leftover women. So. In, now on reflection, I think I'm very grateful for that outreach because without without that outreach, I won't have started this uh, this project, which came um, came to become this book. So it kicked off my scholarly inquiry to trying to really understand um, this kind of a tormented feeling that for me as a individual uh, as a woman from this co my own research cohort, and that sense of uh, when I was turning to 27. And this kind of feeling of what the question for me is like, what does that actually mean to be a woman? Why I personally, as well as when I was talking to a lot of my girlfriends, we feel like constantly battled with this kind of constraints and as if we were pushing towards one single prescribed destiny almost. 
So I was uh, desperate to try and find, find answers. So to, to a large extent, I think it's a quite self-indulgent project, I have to, have to be honest. But at the same time, I do believe that um, the personal experience is also political and the micro political and cultural structure and as well as individual experience can be mutually illuminating. So I believe that the stories and well, the findings for this book will be able to speak to others um, for people who share similar background as me. So I really hope that um, this can add something valuable to the journey of others for many young women, women um, who live in China like myself. So um, for this project, I took a feminist approach. Um, when I say feminist approach, it's mainly trying to um, understand the social reality from their own perspective and especially their subjective perception of uh, personal identity as well as their understanding of uh, their class bound uh, understanding of success to explore their uh, the lives of urban middle class women born on, as I said the one uh, the first generation of China's one child policy uh, who most all of my women were born in the 1980s so after uh, they enter the society world what does that mean in Chinese terms like before you finish your education you're not really in the society yet yeah so once you start your professional life you're really encountering the so-called real life problems. That is what uh, my book is focused on, is how they, these women navigate um, the, uh, these kind of contending ideologies and discourses as um, Frank has already illustrated beautifully um, previously, how they negotiate all these tensions. So I believe that um, my research cohort, these women, as they were born in the 1980s, the first generation of one only child, they were privileged in several ways. First is that they were privileged through their urban birth, for those of you who are familiar with the Chinese context, I believe that most of you would agree this kind of there is this kind of long-lasting entrenched urban-rural divide that has only been exacerbated uh, by the economic reform and basically since the 1980s. So if you, you were born in the city, obviously you will have much better access to healthcare, for example, better easier access to better educations, and also the um, in terms of the implementation of the one-child policy, and the rural families has showed much stronger resistance to this policy, whereas the urban um, uh, families who, because of the different, their different sort of uh, productive model, had um, kind of like um, complied to the one-child policy better in that sense. Therefore, this kind of um, social context give rise to uh, only daughters born in the cities enjoying the much sort of like much um, unprecedented family investment into their educations. That gives them, because of lack of si uh, siblings and competitions. So a lot of these kind of family um, uh, invest, uh, invested into their education because they are the so-called only hope for the family, the only child. So because of their urban birth, they are privileged and because of the family inv uh, investment into their education, as well as during uh, the time they were growing up, since the late 1990s and beginning of 2000, China also expanded significantly its higher education and enrollment. So when these women, the first generation of one, uh, uh, one child, reached the age of um, well, 18, when they started to enter universities, the chances of them to get into university in China has significantly increased, even though, um, relatively speaking, it is still a very, quite a small cohort in comparison to the big, uh, the overall uh, population. However, because of their urban privilege and because of family um, investment in their education, a lot of these women are able to enter universities and become the first generation of um, being educated in, in, at the university level. So all my participants have at least uh, finished a four years undergraduate degree. Um, a lot of them actually also studied abroad and returned to China. And then a few of them actually had a PhD degree as well. So because of their higher education, and I argue that I believe that this enabled them to um, well, basically um, take this kind of white collar profession, jo professional jobs, which forms this kind of, uh, well, Part, large part of China's so-called rising middle class. And they were working in the city, working in this kind of white collar uh, jobs that um, allows them to become part of the middle class. And at the same time, I'm, I acknowledge that the, well, the term of middle class is very much contested. And then the China's middle class is very much a heterogeneous and cohort. But um, as I say, they, they, this, because of these uh, multiple privilege of these women, I think they can be loosely classified as the rising middle class. And because of uh, these uh, multiple privilege, I think their so-called middle class identity at this point, it's also, um, we have to see that, the, I would argue it's also a 
by product or state engineering uh, project in the sense of pushing China into the, to become modern and um, in, to to increase uh, the uh, the the how to say the number of China's middle class. So it was very much in, encouraged by the state in terms of their consumption habit as well as their lifestyle that they supposedly uh, need to embody to embody this middle class identity. I'll come back later when I show you uh, more detail of my findings. So back in 2015, I uh, carried out my field work and I used mainly used in-depth interviews in, uh, in two cities, Shanghai and Chengdu. Um, so I interviewed about 31 women as well as 11 of their male peers, which I think give me uh, enough um, research findings, well, basic data to make my argument. So this one, which is a picture I made for myself based on the data I collected, I think Frank, <laughs> we already mentioned earlier, like this kind of restlessness of women face, they have to uh, constantly running in order to achieve a, a, achieve their set target. And since the today's panel is about China's restless young women, I think this, uh, this picture included in my book is rather fitting. So um, as you can see here, Typically, if you are a female st a student finishing your undergraduate degree in China, it, you are about the age of 22. Yeah. And then you're starting to look for jobs. And, and, and also at the same time, your family will starting to say, well, it's time for you to find to start to date and find a, a suitable marriage partner. So um, before you reach the so-called deadline for marriage, label being labeled as uh, leftover women, you have about five years to both pin down a husband as well as find a suitable job. Okay, um, and then you, um, then if you are lucky enough to marry by then, you have about three years left to give birth, yeah, at least to the first child under the current three child policy. Just bear in mind in the last three years, well, four years, we have seen this kind of changing uh, policy from switching from the one child policy to the more pro-natalist sort of uh, three child policy because, because of China's uh, so-called demographic crisis, aging population and shrinking um, labor supply. So there is this an added pr pressure on women and um, to give birth to more children as well. So if you um um if you okay if you manage to have the first child give birth to the first child by the uh, um, year of uh, by the age of thirties. You also need to bear in mind, if you haven't done that, by reaching the age 35, it is a very dangerous age according to this kind of prevalent uh, discourse understanding of what is understood as a risky sort of pregnancy. Um, China, well, as is one of the countries that has a strong sort of belief in eugenic practices and um, because partly because of its lack of welfare support from the states so family really feels a burden if um if they have to have to deal with uh, disabilities themselves so there is this strong belief that we need to make sure our children are healthy the good qualities and also there obviously there's this kind of strong state push discourse of high quality births both in terms of physical quality as well as this in a cultivated educational um, um, capital, if I may say. So there was this another um, the final deadline, alarming deadline for risky pregnancy. So think about if you are so-called well, highly educated, well-educated, finishing, let's say, undergraduate degree, you, you are facing this rather rigid deadline. If you are having a PhD or if you're doing a master overseas, obviously that add, add another extra layer of you need to run it even faster. So I think it might be quite um, important to highlight that I myself have surpassed this deadline of uh, risky pregnancy. So therefore I should put myself there. So I think this, hopefully this picture highlights the, uh, the heightened tensions these women face and the, also the treacherous path they have to negotiate in order to reach the expected societal sort of ideal, uh, ideal life course. So because of this kind of attention that I organized my book chapters almost following this kind of uh, different stages. So one of my favorite chapter, and as you can see here, which I discussed uh, so, uh, the practice of premarital abortion and its understanding, its perception, as well as it's why it is considered by my participant, even though it's not ideal for the women's reproductive body, as well as it's not the best, it might jeopardize her uh, sort of a marital prospect in the marriage market. But abortion, if, uh, if marriage is not on the table, if she got herself pregnant with her boyfriend, and um, abortion in secret is the only responsible choice. And um, that is one of the key, well, 
in some way a shocking sort of finding that uh, came out from my participants' narratives. So basically the argument uh, presented to me were like, despite the stigma attached to the premarital abortion, all my, of my participants suggested that having an abortion in secret if marriage is not attainable as the only responsible choice for both, um, I, um, also for the unborn child, because you can't really have a child outside of uh, the wedlock, it's not really responsible for the child, it, you are harming their future, and it's also good for your, um, you, um, the having abortion if you come get married, it's good for your family because it protects your family reputations, as well as for their own future, because not, nobody, no man would want to marry somebody who already had a child, yeah, so that's the argument they give me, but this really reviewed a very difficult reality these, these young women have to navigate, because as I mentioned earlier, by um, when they finished university at the age of 20, uh, 22, they were expected to immediately get finding a suitable marriage partner, as well as finding a job, but what is unsaid is before that age, let's say a lot of um, a lot of my participants told, told me that, including my own experience, um, so-called dating in, uh, during school years were well strictly forbidden or discouraged, both by the school as well as by their parents. Yeah. So um, even in the universities uh, during uh, when these uh, my participants were growing up, university were also kind of somehow trying to monitor and policing dating and discourage people, young people to date in universities. But on, on, on the other hand, um, a lot, all of them has acknowledged the fact that premarital sex is very common. Most people do it, but nobody publicly talk about it. On the other hand, in their school years, there was very few, if any, sort of sex education formally provided to them, no, neither from their school nor from their parents. So this obviously unavoidably lead to the young women have to um, expose under this kind of high risk of unplanned pregnancy that might lead to abortion become this kind of only choice for them. So I think that's a, that's a very interesting sort of unexpected findings um, um, I, I kind of uh, came about from my uh, participant narratives. So that's the first sort of contradiction these young women has to navigate in order to protect the future marriage prospect. Um, that lead us to talk about the centrality um, of marriage as this kind of uh, the ideal site to uh, in both sort of this kind of uh, ideal site to um, celebrate their middle class identity. In order to achieve that, there is as I uh, as I showed you the image earlier, there is this kind of so called perfect ideal timing. The so my second chapter, an analysis chapter, is about timing motherhood and its natural uh, its naturalization within marriage. It basically highlights that how it's not only one, um, it's not only about the biological timing, but also the social timing. It's not like you can't, as I mentioned earlier, it's almost incomprehensible to uh, for these women to have children outside of marriage. Therefore, they have to do uh, marriage first and then have child before the deadline. So obviously, this lead them to become again and the tension barriers. But the most of the stress these women face in terms of pressurizing them to get married and have children, although this kind of discourse and belief or ideal um, embodied, um, uh, presented to them in this, through this kind of heteronormative marriage regime is, uh, is encouraged by the state. But interestingly, the, the, a lot of these women we're talking about, they don't really care about how other people think. The real pressure they feel is from their uh, intimate family members, especially their mothers, their parents, because of this kind of an um, increased emotional bond between the only child and their uh, their uh, their parents. So so their 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 family member becomes almost like the most effective um, effective. I would argue almost like an effective tool to pressurize these young women. On one hand, they have this kind of self-enterprising, trying to be pushed back to this kind of gen essentialist understanding of their gender role in Chinese society. But on the other hand, because of this kind of new neo-traditionalist familial, uh, familialism, as um, Professor Martin has mentioned, really somehow, uh, because also because of the emotional bond, really tied them back to this kind of traditional life course, which I find really um, depressing in many ways. Because we all know if you love somebody, you somehow have less a uh, power to push back and upset them. My third chapter is basically I'm trying to unpack the concept of the gendered concept of success, Chen Gong in the Chinese term, and how this concept of Chen Gong has become hegemonic. That um, answered one of the questions I was wondering. Well, obviously it's very difficult. It's almost like um, the, the these young women women facing these contending ideologies, uh, facing this almost. Um, difficult task for them to really achieve. Why? 
will achieve according to the expected social societal norm. But why so many of my peers still were willing to make compromises and embody this form of um, success? So that is lead me to really uh, trying to understand how this kind of there is this kind of weird collaboration between uh, the making of a modern desirable self encouraged by this kind of neoliberal ethos on one hand and as well uh, how, how this ideology in some way incorporated within um, the state encouraged sort of familial, uh, familialism that is embodiment of happiness is within marriage and then th which marriage is the ideal site to both display your privilege as well as um, uh, for your personal enjoyment. So when the when heter heterosexual marriage being presented as a site, uh, both for in personal enjoyment as well as your social sort of status and a sign of success, obviously it's really difficult for um, for individual to resist this kind of pressure. So, um, but another another layer of contradiction I observed here is that uh, all these young women talking about they really um, they were really keen to cultivate this kind of self development both through um, finding a, a desirable a professional sort of respect respectable professional work because trying to secure their own values through paid work none of them have uh, have said they would actually willing to give up their paid work so and on the other hand they believe that uh, they need to have this kind of financial security have independent income in order to um, enjoy the life they want, displaying her values through lifestyle, for example, um, the handbag freedom, as um, you mentioned earlier. So I think the, these all coming together make them believe that once they uh, invest enough into their, themselves, they will be able to locate it um, at a better position in the marriage market, therefore enable them to find a better marriage partner. But par uh, paradoxically, we all know that um, the, con the continuing sort of um, women marry up this kind of societal norm uh, means that these women once they the more time they invested in themselves to uh, to push themselves up to the societal ladder social ladder the less uh, the smaller pool they have actually to select um, a so-called suitable marriage partner according to the the gender sort of exi existing gender relations so what we see is a lot of my participant talks about um, they have to somehow perform their gender for in order to find love to play down downplay their achievement and to pretend they are this kind of needing protections and then uh, this kind of cute lovely uh, female ideal female partners for their uh, in order to secure their marriage so I think that's another layer of a contradiction there my my final chapter is basically quite straightforward, and then um, which I trying to highlight the contrast between the the so called rosy pictures and presented in in this kind of happy married family life imagined by a uh, young woman before they got married versus the, the realities of a married life presented by my participants, especially those with children. So I try to illustrate that the interlocking dilemmas faced by women in both their workplace as well as their uh, um, their care uh, care duties at home to try to show that how uh, how this uh, the assumed caring responsibility for women further marginalize their uh, their chances to progress at work both from recruitment as uh, to the promotion so um in many ways that the the double burdens imposed by their married domestic life and the neoliberal market demand on a hyperproductive laborers and that weighs these women down through both reproductive and productive value chain in this both chain they basically were disprivileged so to this point, I think these findings are, uh, are hardly surprising at all because we have seen similar patterns uh, across the world uh, when we, the, the whole, well, the, under globalization, we see this kind of similar neoliberal term restructuring. A lot of the double burden is not unique in China, but I think in many ways in the, um, in the Chinese con context, it somehow has been exacerbated because of this kind of neo, neo traditionalist uh, sort of uh, culture. If I may quickly conclude, and I think I totally agree with uh, Professor Martin, I think these young women face a lot of contradiction in their life, but in also at the same time, they were left very much on their own device to navigate because their, the structural problem has been presented as their personal private uh, problems to deal with. And then, so if I use my own um, analytical framework, I'm trying to locate these individual women, their life into this kind of grander um, 
a wider uh, social and political structure within China, that we, uh, within the structure, the family is still considered as the cell of the society, therefore is a target of uh, government control and policing. So I, um, therefore I argue that centrality of a heterosexual marriage is the primary governing institution remains to be so in the organization and reproduction of labor for the market economy and in views with gender inequality as we uh, hopefully have highlighted. And therefore I argue that women's subordination is often concealed by a gendered middle class success story centered on the happy and full family imagery that is closely aligned with the party state's vision to govern this nation through governing the family for social stability. Uh, we all know that social stability requires a lot of care work and reproductive work that is done by women. And therefore women's struggle is largely silenced and privatized within the family. And consequently, consequently and their sh women's shoulders the political burden of maintaining the productivity and reproductive of a modern nation, especially for these uh, privileged women, middle class women, they were considered as the ideal candidates to produce high quality children and have the ca financial and cultural capital to reproducing a modern nation to continue um, the so current uh, status quo. So therefore, I think I can only foresee the heightened pressure under the current change to the uh, three child policy. Yeah, that's all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. I have received a deluge of questions for both of you. Um, let's see, we'll try to get to all of them uh, if we have time, but if not, uh, please do forgive me if we can address all of them. I will waste no more time by jumping straight into one of our first questions from myself. Um, um, I want to ask several things. First of all, why is it so important for us to um, to, to study middle-class urban women with privileged opportunities. What kind of core values do they represent in China's pursuit of common prosperity? Could either of you um, take this question? Kailin, would you like to? Uh, Start? Sure. <laughs> oh, sorry, I don't mean to throw you into it, but I'll give you a chance. <laughs> sorry, yeah. Um, Sorry, would you mind repeat the question again? Um, I was asking why is it so important for us to focus to uh, uh, to study um, privileged um, Chinese young women, either they're students or they're in the young 30s, wrestling critical life stages. Um, what kind of core values do these women represent in China's pursuit of common prosperity? Okay, um, I, pro I, think, I think I probably can answer the first part of your questions and the why study the privileged women, which is also one of the questions I wrestled with uh, when I was writing up my project, because a lot of uh, people would ask, well, there are a lot of these privileged women that need to be understood and see uh, to find a solution to in, in, in improve their condition. Why privileged women? But my answer would be, well, yes, there are, uh, obviously, there are a lot of scholarship has already focused on these privileged women. Actually, there are very little to work, uh, at least when I started my project um, to focus on privileged women, which I think is equally important in the sense that if we talk about con uh, the continuity of gender inequality in Chinese society, especially the post-socialist society, um, looking at so-called privileged women's gender experience would be, it really enable us to throw the gender inequality in Chinese society into sharp relief. That's the first uh, reason. Another is that I think, um, especially for the so-called privileged middle-class urban women, and as I mentioned briefly in, in my presentation, I think middle-class, I would argue, is a political project. It's engineered by the state to encourage, uh, to push, well, um, encourage, promote economic development, at, as well as um, they become the cohort, in, at large become this embodiment of a desirable sort of um, their their consumption habit as well as the cultural capital becomes the example uh, that is advocated by the state for becomes a, the ideal for the rest of a society to follow, and then which which I think in order to, if we understand the gendered construction of subject subjectivity within the middle class will enable us to illuminate the structural uh, constraints the the rest of the society were encouraged to embody and then it's not it's not it's these these uh, this kind of embodiment cannot easily be achieved just by simple individual um sort of striving fundo 
that's the Chinese term, so striving towards the success, is a lot of structural uh, issues has been, as I argued in my book, and I think not only gender success becomes a, uh, the cover of the structural problems, but I think in general, the middle class has become um, this kind of alluring, desirable, uh, desirable sort of, uh, social positioning um, that gloss over a lot of structural issues Chinese uh, society face. So I think it's very important for us to deepen our understanding um, on the so-called privileged cohort. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. Um, so I just, I, I don't have much to add. I mean, that's a great answer. I, I feel in relation to the second part of your question, Mimi, um, I mean, just to put it crudely, if, if, if the state and commercial culture and general public culture is positing the middle class lifestyle as, as a common aspiration toward which we should all aspire. And, and it is doing that. I mean, I've worked on this a little bit in previous work as well, including my work on um, with Sun Waning and, and Tanya Lewis in the book Telemodernities, where we looked at this at lifestyle television and the way it promulgates in, in China um, a, a, a sort of valorization of middle class lifestyle aspiration. So if that's what people are being encouraged to aspire toward, and it undoubtedly is for all kinds of reasons to do with, you know, as, as um, Kai Ling so rightly says, to do with the, the, the leadership's vision of what will create and, and promote social stability, then it's very important that we look at, well, what's the actual experience of people who have so-called achieved this, <laughs> this level of lifestyle and this level of identity, is it perfection? Is this, is this really as, as simple and as beautiful and as lovely as the media and, and, and the state and others would have us believe? Or are there in fact unlivable tensions in the core of that, including you know, gendered tensions for even for women who on the outside look as if they have it all. They look like a success story for the country um you know for Chinese women more broadly but what's the cost you know and what's the unlivable part in there as well thank you um so my next question would um also touch on the similar lines um we're looking at um, women are being excluded in the majority of policy decision making and lawmaking and there, there's a current um top level push for uh higher fertility and while there is an adequate uh, support such as child support or financial inducement to um, for Chinese women to you know um, have more children, and at the same time we're also seeing um, there isn't adequate tools for for women suffering from like uh, sexual abuse or domestic violence to break down the law enforcement or judicial barriers um, when it comes to protecting themselves. Um, so. Are you, in light of these contexts um, that are currently going on in China, are you seeing or witnessing a trend um, that um, there is likely an intensifying gender conflicts or growing pushback among Chinese women? And, and also, um, are, are Chinese women basically lying flat these days to defy Beijing's politics, uh, uh, Beijing's policies in, um, in, uh, under the free child directives? I can just briefly answer that in relation to women who study in Australia in my in my group that I got to know so well. I mean that many of the, some of them started out already with a resistant attitude to all this nonsense about the marriage deadline and the pressure. What is this nonsense? What is this shen yu? What what the hell? You know, there was a, a small group of them were already very critical of that when when I met them um, at the start of their studies or near the start of their studies. And I mean, as I said, I found that the time abroad being away really uh, exacerbated that critical trend. And it's not just the gender critique that got stronger while they were abroad, you know, a general reflexivity towards norms and values of all kinds back in China was evident in the, in the cohort as a whole, as a result of mobility. And I don't, I mean, I think in my observation, I wouldn't say that that's necessarily about sort of so-called absorbing Western values or something, even though the women themselves sometimes would say that. It was never clear to me where exactly they would be absorbing these values from, given that they struggled to make local friends and be accepted in, into the local culture in any deep way, or many of them struggled. So I feel, based on observation and some thinking about this, it was more to do with the distance, the psychological distance from the home culture and also being put 
in a kind of a uh, very special situation where they're hanging out with a whole hundreds or thousands of other young women like themselves and they can get together and talk about all this stuff and go, hang on, <laughs> there's something wrong here. So I, I feel that, that there's a number of factors underlying the way that that kind of critical consciousness was able to grow, um, particularly in relation to gender during their years abroad, um, for sure. Eileen? Yeah, and I totally agree. And I think um, one thing I would add is that I do agree. I think the mobility, especially international mobility, or even within uh, within China itself, when the young people were living away from their uh, parents and working in the bigger cities, that also somehow disembed uh, them from this kind of traditional sort of expectation. But at the same time, when we talk about the, um, the potential gendered conflicts, and I think um, we already witnessed this kind of the rising, so-called rising uh, uh, conscious or feminist conscious among China's young generations. Yeah, there's a unquit well, critical discussion groups on online, even though some of them got censored, but there's still this kind of um, very active and alive very much so. Um, the, so the gender conflict is already has started a long time ago. And then, um, but I don't think there's actually an easy way for either for the state or even for the family to completely erase them or monitor them completely because these women have all sorts of resources as young people do uh, to organize themselves, to continue those debates. Another thing in terms of this kind of uh, increased pressure to um, have more children, I think, um, a friend of mine, Mei Feng, you know, who's also a journalist, I remember she uh, smartly commented, she said, well, it's, the, it's funny for the state to believe that um, they could, uh, a few generations ago, they could com uh, com uh, tell, tell the public, stop having more children, just have one, and, and, and then now switch a new term, say now you go to have more children, yeah. So you can't just turn, um, turn on and off the women's reproductive body like a water tap. It does not work like and also it's much easier for, uh, for the state policing or force people to have abortion or control, um, uh, give them sterilization instead of standing in somebody's bedroom and watch them to make sure they, they carry, uh, they, they get themselves pregnant. This is just unrealistic. So um, on the other hand, in terms of the social welfare structure within, uh, within China's society is very much lacking this kind of systematic support. So I don't think um, even, even, for, um, even for just middle class family, if we look at the family, as a unit instead of just the individual women. And a lot of family, both husband and wife, experience this pressure, the financial pressure to raise up good quality children. And as it's, that, that's what is expected to invest a lot in the children's education, which we all know that it's very expensive in China nowadays. So this kind of lying flat is, um, I think in this sense, the Chinese women would be able to easy, find easy allies with their potential partners because they, they all, if they want to uh, secure their own sort of consumption habit in uh, living in uh, Chinese cities, it is not that easy. They, uh, they won't easily give in to have more children just for the sake of it. And it's always a carefully calculated move for middle class families, unless there is this kind of, well, if one partner, the, especially the husband, earns far more, um, um, have far more incomes and that secure the family sort of uh, financial status, then that, that might change the dynamics a little bit. So I think it's a, it's, it, we need to be very nuanced and careful about analyzing um, the current shift in terms of policy. Thank you for your insight, both of you. Uh, we next have a question for Dr. Martin from Dr. Katrin Coast. Um, Dr. Martin, do you see a correlation between personal ambition, especially self-confidence, zixin, and the confidence doctrine, zixin lun, as spelled out by the CCP? That's, that's a good question. I, I must answer that um, honestly and briefly and say I have not studied that correspondence, but I would not be surprised if there was one. <laughs> um, I mean, it seems logical. It, it's really, I mean, the, 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 the sort of discourse of self-confidence for women is absolutely unavoidable, as I'm sure you know, in Chinese public culture today. I mean, again, it comes out in popular media, it comes out in the way people talk about themselves and their aspirations it comes out in the way mothers talk about their daughters it's 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 very pervasive um now i think it's probably i'm just speculating now wildly but i think it's possibly part of a global set of discourses which we might 
broadly and probably reductively call neoliberal of, of sort of relying on oneself and pushing oneself forward in the in in the sort of um, ambition to strive for success and so on. But I, I mean, clearly, it's also going to have um, some kind of connection with with uh, the, the party's own discourses on the very same topic. So I, I think that would be a topic for my further study. Thanks for suggesting it. Um, next, we have a question from Phoebe uh, for Dr. Xie. Dr. Xie, do you think their privileged status in society hinders them from fully experiencing or underestimating the pain that maybe more lower class women experience under the patriarchy? I'm asking this question because I recall an interesting phenomenon, so-called pink feminist, or of a group of women who are both feminists, but also hardcore nationalists. And they also oppose the government in a few areas where their resources can't resolve. Also because they would gain so much more by playing, um, to, to play by the patriarchal rules. So um, if I, thank you very much, Mimi. And if I understood correctly, so the question is about whether this uh, privileged woman would underestimate the pain experienced by women who are more disprivileged. Um, I would say we are all, as individuals, we are all bound by our class positions and our upbringings, which shape our perception of reality. So I, um, the, well, one of the easy answers I would say, absolutely possible. But I also think there is this kind of critical um, aspect of uh, raising collective consciousness that we also see among Chinese young women. So even though, um, even though there are, well, they're privileged, as I mentioned earlier, given them educational capitals and therefore this kind of education in, in, in many ways actually also raise the awareness a feminist awareness among this group that a lot of activists um, come from this kind of similar background or through their education, through exposure to international education, et cetera, et cetera, actually enables them to see the structural problems that their uh, sisters um, face within China. So we, for example, a few, I think a few years ago, we saw um, this kind of um, activism um, collaboration between educated Chinese university students with working class uh, the workers, factory workers in Guangzhou, um, which I, I would use that as, as a sort of sign for the potential. It's not this kind of easy cut in terms of the privilege and the disprivilege. It's hard for, to see the other side. But I think there's also the crit a critical aspect of it, the education can bring about in terms of shaping our perception and illuminating our own social positioning as well as understanding others. So I think um, that's one uh, point I want to make. Um, in terms of the pink, little pink, nationalistic uh, little pink, which I, I totally agree with you, and I think this is a real sort of phenomenon that might also uh, lead, um, lead us to May, how help me to answer the question? I think uh, somebody earlier, sorry, asked about the zixin lun, the, um, zixin lun, and whether there's any link between the personal ambition versus the kind of state discourse of confidence, boosting conf collective confidence, or na national. Almost, I I haven't studied zixin lun itself, but my previous um, uh, paper I wrote with uh, with my colleague Yun Zhou actually, we we kind of trying to unpack this kind of the nationalistic propaganda came about under COVID-19, which we see that the strategy used by a lot of uh, the current nationalist discourse promoted by the state very much hinge upon this kind of individualistic desires of being recognized or being encouraged in the society. For example, volunteers um, in COVID-19, they were um, held as heroes. Yeah, so this kind of heroic uh, um, labeling of individuals and praising individuals, um, incorporating individual desires into the nationalistic discourse of confidence, I think is a very much obvious strategy that we see as, uh, has been used currently. So I don't know whether that will somehow relate to the, to the previous question. Um, so I think there, the, I would say, I would argue, I think there is definitely a purchase of the collective branding of confidence nation versus the, the neoliberal self-fashioning of self-confidence and ambition. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I must get on because we still have like over a dozen questions. Next, we have a question from Lulu Li at Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, for Dr. Martin, I wonder whether if your respondents are mostly single daughter from middle class urban families, if so, are their single child identity as well as gender affect their decision making when choosing their locality choice 
after graduation or board. And whether they have confronted any family conflict when it comes to their location choice after graduation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. I think that's very much to the point. Um, most of uh, the young women I worked with were single daughters, only children, but not all. Um, there was a handful that had siblings and I noticed it did tend to weigh in their decision making somewhat. Um, I mean, there's sometimes for some individuals, it seemed that when there was an elder sibling, particularly who'd already established a family and so on, there, there might be less pressure then on the younger daughter to um, go and do all of that herself. And in some cases that allowed, it seemed to me that that weighed in the balance of allowing individuals to think about alternative life plans, including traveling far away and including, you know, not following the standard life course. Um, but for most of my participants, I mean, I, I, I noticed this right from the beginning, even when in the first interviews, um, when the, some of them were really quite young, like I'm um, 17 when I first interviewed them. And they were already, they were at least saying that ultimately, because I asked them, you know, how do you see your life unfolding in terms of geography over the longer term at this early stage? They were already foreseeing that even if they spent several years abroad or traveling, they would ultimately have to or want to come back home to look after their parents in their old age, um, or else they would find a way to bring the parents to Australia. Most of the parents had, by the way, had absolutely no interest in doing that and were kind of appalled by their daughters saying that they're going to force them to go to Australia to be looked after. The parents are still quite young, about my age. Um, so that, yeah, I mean, I, and I did, I did think about that in terms of um, like daughterly filiality and the, and, the, and the kind of gendering of the filial duties, which has, um, you know, researchers in that field have shown this is increasingly in the single child generations, it's increasingly a duty that's put onto or taken up by daughters where once it was traditionally, you know, the province of sons more than daughters to, to, to take on that heavy filial duty. So it certainly weighs in the considerations of ultimately where one is going to be. Um, and I think you're right to suggest really in your question that um, whether there's a sibling, particularly an elder sibling, would, would weigh in the balance there as well. Like if, if, if elder brother is home with a wife and children and is going to be able to look after the parents when they become elderly, then you know, the younger sister could 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 feel a little bit less constrained in some cases. Yeah. Thank you. Um, um, next, we have a question from Florence Ho in Hong Kong for Dr. Xie. I was wondering whether there is an equivalent timeline for men in China, men in China, and how it compares with the timeline for women that Dr. Kaling Xie presented. Thank you very much for the question. I think in, um, just to Briefly clarify, I uh, don't focus on men, although I interviewed 11 male peers of these women. And so I can't, I can't say for sure this represents the whole cohort. However, in my study, I did uncover this kind of gender disparity in terms of ideology and in terms of uh, pressures they, uh, they face. So um, if you remember and in, in my PowerPoint in the first chapter, I talk about the premarital abortion and how this kind of gen, uh, double standards that uh, young people face uh, for women, they are much more under this kind of heavy demoralized sexuality, female sexuality, in comparison to this kind of un understanding of natural male drive and it's just men are easily let off the hook. And when it comes to marriage pressure, yes, there's still this kind of a societal expectation of everybody need to get married. Yeah, the, the embodied of a happy full family is there for everyone. All young people face the same kind of pressure. But for women, especially um, um, young women, they because the, the reproductive capacity is understood as facing this kind of so-called scientific deadlines. So they they obviously, well, whereas male sort of reproductive capacity is very much not uh, under the focus of discussion. So the, the stress and focus is very much on female reproductive body and how they should be young and healthy and to give birth high quality children, yeah. On the other hand, and even though I did not study men and their experience directly, but it comes out very clear in terms of marriage market, um, the still very much strongly dominated understanding of women marry up, yeah, and which means that um, women marry up in, in the sense of like they need to look 
look for partners that in many ways are better than them from education and uh, education qualification to even uh, height. They manage to be taller and look stronger. Um, when it comes to age, women's uh, increase in age in the marriage market significantly decrease their desirability as a suitable partner because of one of the reasons I mentioned in terms of reproductive capacity. Another is that whereas men, in terms of their increasing age and seniority, becomes a bonus point. <laughs> yeah, because men were understood, socially understood, they become more mature, more reliable, so can be a better, become a better family man. Man, uh, responsible to take care of the family. Um, and that is how it is conceptualized. So therefore, uh, I would say, yes, um, they also face pressure to, uh, to do, do this, do, following this kind of life course. But in terms of the time deadlines, they, are, they face much uh, looser sort of uh, 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 stress in that sense. And also in terms of remarriage um, in the marriage market, if um, the, the, the man can easily find younger girls, and whereas a woman, once they married and divorced, you know, divorced the young woman, even if they're in their early 30s, face a lot of stigmatization and discriminations. Whereas a divorced man were considered as matured and experienced. So you, you, we see this kind of multi-layered um, barrier for, uh, for, uh, for young women, uh, in com uh, which severe barriers for young women in comparison to men. So I would say the same sort of expectation for all, but a different kind of uh, stress. Thank you. Um, following that, we've got a question, uh, two questions actually about leftover women. Um, one from Yiling Yao in Beijing. Um, what would the speakers think about the recent local Chinese government appeal for women to marry down the, their social status? Like the local Chinese government asking the leftover women to consider marry rural men who can't find a wife. Do you think this can help solve the problems of gender imbalance, surplus of single women who can't find a husband? And secondly, um, also a question about leftover women from Jason Hong. Um, Shengnu discourse, uh, discourses were greatly led by the state organization like All China Women's Federation. The education, uh, the educated uh, middle class women issue may be bigger than questions of women's subjectivity in China. I was wondering if either of you found any possibility of intersectionality in China. Thank you. Thank you. Can I answer that first question? Because it's just going to be so satisfying to answer um, <laughs> in, a, in a way, in a dark way. Um, the idea that highly educated urban middle class women are going to go and marry rural men, it's not going to happen. However lovely those men may be, I'm sure they are. I don't mean to be discriminatory myself. I'm sure they're wonderful people, but I, I just don't think it's realistic um, of local governments to think that the, the, at least the women I know would put themselves in that situation. They're not desperate. They're angry about the, the pressures they're under for the most part. And those that want to get married can get married. I mean, it's not, maybe it's the age group I've looked at. They have most of my participants are not much older than their late twenties. So some have got married and, and they married men that they were in love with and they, they you know, wanted to marry, whether they were match made by their parents or, or, with, or someone they found themselves. Um, the others don't want to get married yet. That's why they're not. Um, so, and you know, we saw we saw the quote from um, Chin saying, um, she was, um, I think 26 or 27 when she talked about the bag buying freedom as her next goal. Um, she, and she said she'd absolutely deleted get married from her to-do list. It just didn't interest her. She was having a great life in a, profession, in a professional career um, in, in Shanghai. She's a rather well-resourced young woman. She's got nothing to worry about. She's not going to go and marry a rural man. I mean, it's just not, it's not going to happen. Um, it's, it seems pie in the sky. I, I mean, I, I know what's behind those suggestions, but it, it seems very unlikely to succeed. And I think it will just make these women angry about being asked to do that. Um, intersectionality, yeah. Um, I think there, of course, there can be intersectionality among Chinese middle-class women. I mean, they're from different parts of China. Some of them, uh, the, the status of their parents has changed over the parent's lifetime. Some of my participants' parents were born in, into uh, a peasant uh, household registration, Nomin Hukou, 
and have made their way into the middle classes during the 80s and 90s when social mobility was more possible. Some of them um, come from very small cities and small towns. Um, some are from ethnic minorities, um, so-called. So their experience of the way in which gender traditions work in families might be different from someone from a big metropolis on the East Coast, say, who's from a Han um, fa majority family. So there would be a gender and a, a, an ethnic, you know, intersection there. There could also be um, religious or other kinds of ethnic identifications that are impacting the way in which these women experience their gender and their gendered subjectivity. So I don't see intersectionality as something that is confined to, um, say, or other kinds of societies where maybe there's more or different kinds of diversity in terms of different migrant identities or, or whatever. There's always class, there's always ethnicity and there's you know gender and, 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 and other location. Of course, age, all of these things intersect. That's the way I understand the theory of intersectionality. So I'm not sure if that addresses your question adequately, but thanks. Any input from Kylie before I move on to the next question? May I just join the pleasure of answering the first question? Because <laughs> I think, I mean, I also read that news and I just thought that's a, such an ingenious idea. Who I wonder who like came about this so-called uh, solution. Because in my study, as I, as I said earlier, this kind, is this exactly this kind of romanticized vision of heteron uh, heteronormative love has become this kind of most uh, desirable selling force for marriage to encourage women to marry. Yeah. Otherwise, who, why marry? I mean, if you are in financially independent, what is the trick? So if you say if nowadays the marriage um, is sort of conceptualized by um, formed by so-called romantic love, first of all, you need to fall in love. Yeah. The parental control of their children is not the same like at the beginning of uh, 20th century. There was still this kind of practice of arranged marriage. Even if, let's say, we go back to that transition, China still have this very strong belief in matching windows and doors. Yeah. So first of all, the individual need to find some common ground to fall in love, which it happens like a, a urban um, young people resident falling in love with somebody from the countryside, which happens quite a few cases. There were even like TV shows made by this kind of thing, but there were a huge society discussion about, oh my gosh, this kind of love, believe in love. They don't really understand this uh, reality, blah, blah, blah. So I find it's impossible to implement um, this kind of so-called solution. And it, will, it won't happen. Sorry, I'm gonna just stop there. <laughs> okay, um, we do have a lot of questions. We only have about seven minutes left. I'll be really quick. A question from Valentina Zhang for Dr. Martin. She said she was struck by the point that gender shapes mobility and mobility shapes gender. It is a very important point. I was wondering if this would be applicable to the process of rural migrant women going to the city as well. Yes, absolutely. That's that's one of the really interesting um, kind of extrapolations or parallel ways of thinking that I've, I've enjoyed dur during this process is reading other researchers' work about rural migrant women uh, coming to cities um, and finding new ways of being, you know, new, new kind of zones of possibility for new kinds of gendered selfhood, new kinds of intimate relationships away from the surveillance of family. Um, I'm thinking of Liu Ting Ting's work here, also um, people like um, Gaetano's research in, in this field. There's, I mean, there's a whole, there's a whole kind of fantastic group of feminist scholars who, who, who look at um, migrant women laborers and the way uh, workers and the way that, that mobility impacts their gendered experience. I'd also say, you know, not, not only them, but also um, university students in general, even if I think, I think um, actually Kaling maybe was making this point before, even if you don't leave China to go to study, if you go to another city and live away from your family in a dormitory or another situation, um, you know, researchers have found that 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 that, that, that will have some impact on, on people's sense of themselves as gendered and sexual subjects as well. So it is something about moving away from home contexts, being distanced from the social surveillance of the elders and being together with other people your own age where you can develop, maybe unknowingly develop a kind of almost like an alternative system of gendered value. So that's an excellent point. Thank you.
Okay, um, next question is from Andrea. I have a question to both speakers. How does this hegemony of Chenggong and the ideology of Ziji the relate to what Wang Jing described in her book, The Other Digital China, about millennials' digital philanthropy from the less privileged compatriots to environmental issues? That's a very specific question. <laughs> and there's about five moving parts in there. I'm just trying to get my head around it. So we've got the, the hegemony of Chenggong and we've got- the ideology Ziji, of Ziji. So like Kao Ziji and Chenggong, that's the kind of enterprising selfhood. And then we've got digital cultures in relation to what was the final term? Relate to Wang Jing's described in her book, The Other Digital China, about millennials' digital philanthropy from the less privileged compatriots to environmental issues. I don't know. I, I just can't. I don't know. That's so specific. I, I haven't looked at that particular digital culture. So, I, I mean, Surely there's some connection, but I, I'm not the right expert person to talk about that, sorry. Well, let's move on to more questions. We still have a lot of them. Uh, one is from Zhang Linzhi, doctor, a question for Dr. Kai Lingxie. How about middle-class housewives given women's rate of participation in labor force dropped dramatically? Sorry, how um, the housewives, sorry. How yeah. the middle-class housewives uh, given women's rate of participation in labor force has dropped dramatically. Um, okay, so first of all, in my when I was doing my field work, none of them, apart from one woman just gave birth, none of them were actually full time housewives. So because uh, because of the fear of lagging behind, um, if they stay at home, so the sense of like they have to be desirable, even when they after they got married, they still need to maintain themselves as a desirable partner. And one of the way of doing it is they have to feel they feel they have to being connected to the real society through uh, participating in the work, in the, in the workforce. So that's not something I'm uh, specifically looking at. And then um, among my participants, the full-time housewife is still very much either understood as a luxury for the Uber elite, or the, uh, the, when the husband actually earns a lot to be able to enable the whole family to enjoy this kind of elite lifestyle without any financial concern, or were considered as absolutely a not desirable choice to, for their own understanding of becoming the desirable in, individual. So um, in terms of the dropping uh, labor participant rate, which I also noticed, which is a quite, I don't know whether it's need to be necessary to be a warring trend, but certainly I think um, it does suggest the changing, the shifting sort of po policies about uh, shifting from the one child to three child, three child policy does have certain in impact um, on women. Either they they do uh, experience heightened this pressure to carry out their family caring duties, therefore uh, give up. They can't do everything or there is this kind of heightened uh, discrimination because of the, the market perception of the impact of this policy on families. Women were even more discriminated in terms of recruitment and promotion. That might further push the so-called increasing phenomenon of full-time housewife. So um, I think that would be interesting thing to look at in the coming years, yeah. So we only have one minute left. Uh, let's try to fit in two more questions related to feminism. One from Yi Cheng um, uh, for both speakers. During your studies, do you have any observations about these women having radical feminist ideas or their attitudes towards the ongoing feminist movement, especially conspicuous, conspicuous on social media, especially feminist ideas about so-called Liu B Si T. And also a similar question from Nicola. Do women in these two groups in any way relate to feminism? Put differently, have young feminists found a way to resist the pressure put on them? Thank you. I can answer that, I think, fairly quickly. Um, I found in my group there was a, that same group of um, young women who from the very beginning were very critical about gendered sort of social norms and their own position within them. They were committed feminists. I don't think that they were part of any organized group, but they read things online that were part of like feminist style 
kind of um, groups or accounts. Um, so they, they were quite self-conscious about that and often spoke about gendered power issues. Um, I had very interesting discussions with some other participants. I think at the other extreme, there were those who kind of felt like feminism was a bit of a scary word and it must mean that that's about women wanting to be better than men. Um, and, you know, being a teacher, I couldn't help but sort of open up a discussion about how that's not the case. It's about gender equality. <laughs> um, and we had some good discussions and that sort of said, oh, well, if that's the case, then I must be a feminist. But the feminist consciousness, like as such, using a term for feminism, whether that's, you know, new gender or new thing or whatever, any term or the English term, um, wasn't particularly sort of self-consciously high, even though the, the attitudes of, of many of the participants were feminist, I thought, but they were not particularly kind of hyper aware of that. Um, I mean, I guess maybe we need to look at uh, the types of like young women that they were. The, the major a, a, a majority in my group reflects a general broader trend um, in Australia anyway, to be studying fields like finance, accounting, um, and so on, like those kind of financial or, or com commercial fields. Among the student, the few of them that were studying in the arts field or in social sciences, that there, there, there would have been more of that kind of consciousness, but um, the majority perhaps were not, not quite used to that way of thinking, but yeah, some were. So I'll, I'll stop there, thank you. Any input from Kylie before I close the session? Um, I think I would I, I would totally agree with uh, Dr. Martin. I think that's um, definitely one one anecdotal story. If I may share quickly, is like when I went into the field um, to introduce myself to my participants, I deliberately um, did not introduce myself as a feminist, even though I am. And one of the reason is because I was self conscious of if I do use the term, I would have labeled myself with loaded uh, connotations, and people might perceive I understood myself my, me my, uh, differently, might respond to me differently. So there, I think there was also this kind of uh, well, social context that um, somehow channeled people shy away from using this term, but that does not necessarily mean that uh, they are not conscious or they are not resisting or they are not, uh, uh, how to say, organizing among themselves in terms of um, showing solidarity. Actually, on the contrary, I think, uh, which is really encouraging for me to see is that the young, younger generation, especially the post 90s or even post 2000 and millenniums, they are very vibrant participants in uh, the feminist movement. And as, I think that's something which which I see as a very encouraging, hopeful sign. Yeah. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, time has run out for us, even though we still have a, maybe a four or five questions from our audience. Um, I would like to uh, remind you that um, I could do um, send these questions to Kailin and a um, friend um, so that they could um, maybe to take a look on what sort of areas of interest coming from public or, or people attending the seminars. Um, thank you so much for your presentation, friend and Kailin, really insightful analysis and taking the time to answer all the questions. Can you tell us where can people f find more about your research or follow your work in future? Yeah, absolutely. Can I put a website in the chat? Is that allowable? I've got a, a research project website that will be the best place for people to find um, further detail. I'll do that now. I will also do the same. Basically, you can find my contact detail as well as my publications on my uh, staff website. I'm just gonna, oh, sorry. I just sent it to a private chat. Everyone in meeting? Yeah. Great, thank you very much for your time and attendance to the seminar. We look forward to having you back in the future. Um, bye for now. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you very much. Bye. Bye.